from Poe is enjoying his free beer oh. from the Anchor Society. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to welcome the second speaker for the affirmative, Jason Savalo. My friends, thank you all for coming out tonight, but let's begin with this rather interesting point. According to Pat, the Catholic Church has been this horrible weight around the necks of humanity. It's been this great source of blood. Now, I have to say, if I believe that was true, and I'll be getting to why I don't in a moment, I would agree that that was an indictment of my church. However, Pat then began by standing up and, began by standing up and telling us he doesn't give a stuff about objective morality. And I have to ask this question. If you don't believe in objective morality, what exact grounds do you have for objecting to this alleged litany of crime. <laughs> what exactly is that? The simple fact is, ladies and gentlemen, let's assume that everything that Pat and Travis are going to say to us tonight is true. What would that mean? It would mean that the Catholic Church has on its hands the blood of an awful lot of collections of chemicals which evolved by random chance for no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> so what? But quite frankly, so much of Pat's alleged alleged litany of blood was so, was absolute nonsense. What he did, he doesn't tell. He's, he's gonna, he gives us his very potted history of the church's role. He won't tell us, for instance, of the days in ancient Rome when pagans, couples would, as was perfectly legal, leave, leave unwanted infants out on trash heaps to starve, and the church would take those children in, baptise them, and have them adopted by a Christian family. He will make mention, of course, he makes mention of a huge amount of fact, totaled entirely selectively, um, all down to the point of Bishop Claudius, and for the benefit of the Catholic, for the benefit of the Catholic, about the mispronunciation, who it here is about the mispronunciation of this name. It, Pat can't just ex operate on the excuse that he is only going on having it heard and had seen it written, because I handed him a leaflet with Bishop Porteous's name on it. I handed him that leaflet myself, and it had Bishop Porteous's name very clearly spelt with a P. <laughs> This alleged, I just did this, the alleged, in, the two, in 1985, we are told, Pope John Paul II told Stephen Hawking that scientists shouldn't look too much into the very beginning of the universe. Now, you'll, very no, you'll note, those of you who, are, who have followed that story and who are aware of it, will perhaps be aware of the fact that very conveniently, Hawking's never said anything in public about that alleged private conversation until after John Paul II was safely dead, couldn't give his own version of events, couldn't, couldn't put it clarify or even outright deny that he'd said what Hawking accused him of saying. And Hawking's only went public after JP2 was safely dead, which was well over a decade after the alleged conversation happened. Um, yeah, so this long litany of alleged sins, um, I won't have time to go into detail of the defence of every single one of the sins that, of the alleged, uh, allegedly irrational teachings that Patrick laid out. It's very easy to list a teaching, declare it irrational, and then move on. As I said, actually demonstrating the rationality of a teaching takes a bit more time. So I'll have to limit myself to one example. And it's an example of a topic that, on which the church's teachings have a great deal of emotional resonance with me, namely the topic of homosexuality. Now, according to Patrick, to stand with the Catholic Church's teachings on sexuality is to be anti-life and anti-love. Now, as I said, this is a huge issue with me. I am, and have been since my 16th birth, since the time I was 16, attracted to persons of both genders. When I became a Catholic at the age of 21, this was, I'm sure you'll understand, a huge issue for me. I have a large number of people who are partly or exclusively same-sex attracted who are very dear friends of mine. What I've come... If, but for those of us who say that the position of the Catholic Church on homosexuality is anti-life and anti-love, simply take a look at the life expectancy statistics of single people 
of people engaged in heterosexual marriage versus those who are in any way actively homosexual. What you will discover, heterosexual marriage greatly improves your life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Active engagement in, homose in, in homosexual, in a homosexual acts or homosexual lifestyle, even when controlled for certain factors, because I realise there are certain factors that lead to the high death rates for gay and lesbian people, which are going to be blamed on a homophobic culture. But even when you control for those, what you will still discover is that homosexual, that the homosexual lifestyle leads to a dramatically reduced life expectancy. And I put to you, my friends, that the Catholic Church is quite right when she says that God made man for woman and woman for man. That the Catholic Church, in fact, is in, is in coherence with the facts and is fundamentally pro-life and pro-love. And, and that, in fact, if you truly love a same-sex attracted person, the most caring, compassionate and loving thing you can do is to do what the Catholic Church does and call them as hard and as difficult as this is, and believe me, I know exactly how difficult this is, to a life of chastity. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to turn as a positive batter as time is growing short to one of the deepest and most fundamental points about another point of Catholic Catholicism and Catholic life. The teachings of the church that God became man on the cross, suffered and died. I want to suggest to you that the Catholic understanding furthermore is that we not merely did God die and suffer for us, but that we can, if we are joined to him and united to him, that our sufferings can be united with the sufferings of Christ on the cross. That our sufferings can be lifted up and joined to him. Now, the effect of this is that it gives to human suffering a dignity that it could not otherwise conceivably have. It gives to our suffering a dignity that on the atheist worldview, and indeed on most religious worldviews, is absolutely impossible. And I want to suggest to, my, to, the, to the atheists in the audience I'm one of the, it is part of the lot of humanity to suffer. I'm sure we have all understood suffering. But I suggest that there are some in this audience who have, at some point in the other, during a time of suffering, felt there must be some point to this that goes beyond, there must be some purpose to this. Because fundamentally, I think atheism is a fundamentally pessimistic philosophy. It believes us in, there are certain suffering, some suffering that good can come out of, but on the atheist worldview, some suffering is just meaningless. It's a brute fact of existence from which no good can come. On the Catholic view, all suffering has that depth and dignity to it. All suffering can have a fundamental good brought out of it that is not possible. And as I said to you, to all the atheists in the audience, if at some point in your life you experience that suffering and feel that there must be a certain uh, feel with certainty that there must be a purpose to it that goes beyond what is possible, what it is a, a, what your philosophy allows. Take a look at the great. Obviously, I cannot in this relatively brief time go into it too much depth. But take a look for yourselves at the huge amounts of writings, particularly those put out by the late John Paul II as his own long and painful death from Parkinson's disease brought out. And you'll realise that life and suffering has a depth to it, has a meaning to it and a resonance to it that is impossible. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to put to you finally this point David started this debate by talking about the two levels of value, objective value and instrumental value from the better term, and Patrick declared that he's simply going to ignore the first and talk about the second. Fundamentally, I say that in point of fact, if you're going to ignore the question of objective meaning and objective purpose, then the instrumental purpose becomes essentially meaningless. Valuable for what? 
valuable for creatures who have no purpose, valuable for creatures who will soon die out, valuable for, as I said, essentially collections of chemicals that randomly evolved for no particular purpose or reason. And so what about their deaths? Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, I suggest to you that at the end of the day, we, we, must, we must, if we're to have a firm, consistent worldview that enables us to deal with this life, affirm that the teachings of the Catholic Church, all of them, are valuable.